and welcome to the What Culture Wrestling Roundtable. We are the Dudley Boys of What Culture. I'm Adam Wilborn, joined by Michael Hamlet and Michael Sidgwick, here to fact check every AEW promise they made on their launch. And if you're a fan of this sort of thing, make sure you subscribe to the What Culture Wrestling Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts from, where we do daily wrestling podcasts reviewing all things AEW and WWE. But Sid, let's dive straight into this. Yep. AEW, the press release from Warner Brothers, when they launched, read they were going to introduce statistics to wrestling for the first time ever. AEW, they say, will raise the stakes for its matches and deepen fan engagement by tracking each competitor's wins and losses as wrestlers pursue championships. Their moves and damage to their opponents will also be analyzed on air to provide insight into their winning streaks. Well, the ranking system did exist. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, it did exist. And that's what part of this sort of mission statement, if you like, um, covers off. Like we saw the rise of Darby Allen. Mm -hmm. is a, he's the example I always use when I address the ranking system and how I wish they would bring them back for a third time now. <laughs> um, because it keeps the booking honest. And more to the point as well, like when you saw those, like the men's rankings as an example. It was just strange to see Darby Allen, who a lot of fans had just been introduced to um, at what, Fighter Fest? Yeah. Like creeping up on, you know, John Moxley, who I think was number one for a long time, and just to see these wrestlers getting pushed in this visual signifier of that, like sort of evidenced, if you like, and reminded you. I just thought it was a great, great idea. It's wild in retrospect, however, how hard they went on this sort of damage to the opponent's skulls and body parts and how effective moves are statistically. That is a huge lead in that original mission statement. That original press release, which is wrestling's back on telly and it's not WWE mm. on a major cable network. It was a huge deal as press release and they go so hard on this statistical stuff. Uh, what are your thoughts, thoughts on it, Hamlet? I suspect they've obviously wanted to do it at some point. They wouldn't have told Warner and indeed the world that they were going to do it. It must have just been determined at some point. This is pretty unworkable, dry. Um, it hardly sort of generates blood feuds. and um, yeah. like, It's all about emotion, basically, professional wrestling. And maybe they quickly realized that. Am I excusing AEW for just dropping it? To a degree, I am. I don't know. Like, I think... They, would, they wouldn't have suggested this unless it came up in a conversation in planning stages and Tony Khan's background in data and enough people that were brought in that were numbers guys and that were detail-orientated guys. And as well, like, and this is probably going to apply to so many of these as we go along, to zoom out the amount of things that they must have been like, not in a million billion years will that absolute show WWE be able to do anything like this. They've abandoned... Every core tenet of professional wrestling by, what, 2019? The limb work was barely a thing. And that's what we're talking about here, yeah. right, in a lot of cases. Limb work to lead to how well you're doing the rankings, about what body part it is that you're particularly selling that week. That's no different than somebody, like Orange Cassidy's wear and tear when he was the international champion. Yes. That's an example of how they might have imagined that could be illustrated, as wrestling has done time and time mm -hmm. again over the years. And I just think, like, what's that thing, like, a, uh, when, like, a committee... Can, like a committee can ruin anything because you take this one good idea and then the idea just gets like picked away. An idea away. made by it's like a horse and a camel, basically. Yes. Yeah, yes. camel is a horse designed by a committee. Yes, there's just so many like humps and bumps that shouldn't necessarily be there, and I think that's ultimately what probably happened here to the point where it just never really even made it to television. When you said about Darby Allen being seen for the first time over that summer, it immediately put me in mind of him drawing with Cody Rhodes and how shocking a hard-worked time limit draw was yes. and the ramifications. So even that was a great illustration yeah. of how this was going to go. Like, you, you might be watching one week and thinking, hey, man, like, if he'd have beaten Cody and he ran him pretty close, he'd be even further up the rankings. Yeah. John Moxley, do you remember him storming into Tony Khan's office because he found out the Kenny Omega match was going to be unsanctioned? Yeah. And he needed that rankings point. Yeah. Like, what do you mean? Now I've got to kick his ass and not get any, not points. Now I can't get the growth I want in my career out of it. All of those were like, were showing, I imagine those were examples of the conversations that took place, but weekly TV is going to weekly TV and the grind and the focus of other things pulled them away. Yeah. yeah. I think they start with the best of intentions. I, we talked at the time and subsequently when they were on about bringing it back about how I liked how it was similar to sort of UFC in terms of, I said, 
you don't have to necessarily be number one on the rankings. They don't always go the number one contender for the next championship match yeah. is number one. Sometimes it is about um, some people have got history in fights or whatever it may be. And the example we always went back to in terms of why the rankings work so well is, of course, and we talked about it actually on the news, uh, me and Hanfler, is the Hangman Page Brian Cage loss. A, a book and master stroke. Mm. A book and master stroke. Just when you think, right, okay, that's your main event, double or nothing. It's going to be Hangman Page versus Kenny Omega. He suffers this crushing loss, which upends absolutely everything. And then the people who were behind him, racking up wins on TV, it was packing Orange Cassidy, yeah. just leapfrogged him in mm. the rankings. It was just absolutely incredible stuff. Uh, the, my favorite explana- uh, exploration sorry, of the ranking system very quickly is ahead of All Out um, 2020, they decided to pit in a gauntlet match uh, the top four ranked tag teams, which I believe were Young Bucks, FTR, mm-hmm. um, Best Friends, and possibly the Natural Nightmares yeah. of QT Marshall and Dustin amazing. Rhodes. It's amazing. And it went from, right, fourth and third start, and second comes in after fourth or third ranked have been eliminated, and then obviously won because you've won the most matches or you're the highest Even ranked. that works. Even that yeah. is fair. Yeah. Like, and that was even fair within yeah. the context. And what was so good about the ranking system is that everyone felt legitimized. These teams felt like the big deal. And that's part of the problem now with AEW is that there's too many acts that you are uh, expected to receive as over and stars. Um, and the idea was in that match, I don't want Young Bucks and FTR to wrestle on free TV. I want to pay for that. <laughs> it was just ridiculous. Like yeah. a really, really good way to drive uh, pushes. Yes, the deep analytical data of the V-trigger, that would cause 80% damage. Was it going to be health bars? I don't know. <laughs> it just was never going to work. I've got a bigger talking point deeper in this about the wins and losses, but that for me, mm. in terms of the analytics, it, it, professional wrestling is all about emotion. And I think maybe even after double or nothing, Cody versus Dustin, they realized that's so much better than numbers. Yeah. Data. Yeah. Uh, also on that press release, Warner Brothers said, uh, wrestlers are also given freedom to explore their characters and highlight their athletic abilities. Whatever you want to say about All Elite Wrestling, and I've said quite a lot negatively this year, um, in particular last year as well. Um, five years in, do you want to read that out one more time? Mm-hmm. Uh, wrestlers are given freedom to explore their characters and highlight their athletic abilities. That is completely and utterly something that they've stayed true to, yeah. whether you like it or not, whether you think they do too much at times, um, whether you think there's too much overlap on a single pay-per-view in terms of uh, they've just bled, uh, he probably shouldn't be bleeding or she, or they shouldn't be bleeding at all in the next match. If anything, this is almost too true. Mm. They've allowed the wrestlers, like, I would say 99 times out of 100. You want to cut a promo? Do it your own voice. Yeah. Like, sometimes, like, to the detriment of programs. Um, I want to be positive about this because it's something they've done and it's something that people were crying out for for years and years and years and years. Like that that WWE style. I mean, it has evolved, but the, the main sort of principle of when people say WWE style in this like sort of derogatory yeah. way is they just get reined in. They're not allowed to do a great deal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we are recording this, what, 24 hours-ish removed from Will Ospreay versus Ray Phoenix. I mean, you'd never see a match like that on North American TV seven years ago, six years ago. Mm. They were absolutely true. Um, If it weren't for the fact that they've got creative control over their characters, this is basically their way of saying unscripted promos. That's what we're going to do. Yes, there's been the odd thing, like Jennifer Pepperman's introduction, the odd vignette that felt heavily filmed and scripted and all the rest of it. But, you know, mostly, mostly they've completely stayed true to this promise for better and for worse. Yeah, sink or swim out there, isn't it? Yeah, indeed. I mean, you either get Eddie Kingston, MGF, CM Punk, John Moxley cutting some of the all-time great professional wrestling promos, Cody Rhodes when he was there, Britt Baker when she yeah. was really getting over, uh, Willow Nightingale's fantastic at it now. Or, like, like this guy's incredible, so I don't want to criticize him, but just to make the point, Darby Allen, the week after they did the uh, the Young Bucks heat angle on Sting's family and, you know, the blood was all over the white suits. I mean, he kind of lost the plot of what he was doing by putting over Cody Rhodes as an EVP instead of the Young Bucks mm-hmm. when the target of that promo should have been, like, we're going to kill you, mm. like, in vengeance for this. So for better or for worse, whether it kind of makes sense or doesn't, they've held true to this promise. I know he was an EVP at the time, so again, maybe slightly different grades of what you're allowed to say, but Cody's last promo 
will go down in infamy. The yes. one he puts in front of the ladder where he just burns through six programs. You don't know what he's saying at half the time. Like, Cody, uh, 2021 brackets general. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think, um, yeah, like this is one of those ones where, yeah, Sidge mentions for better and worse. Obviously, sometimes you're guilty. I'm certainly guilty of it, of like maybe thinking you understand what the what the general pulse is towards a promotion. And I think we've seen, you know, the pendulum has swung just in the time that we've been covering AW and WWE at the same time. It, you know that this, that AW have clung onto this at all costs because when AW is popular and when people broadly are very positive about AW, it is this kind of thing they continue to praise. In 2023, when it really felt like the wheels were coming off a little bit, it was this sort of stuff that people were starting to criticise. MJF was a lightning rod for criticism on the idea that he was got like everything you were watching was straight out of MJF's head onto television and a lot of people didn't seem to like it. And stylistically, it felt opposed to what they mm -hmm. wanted out of AEW. But that was because he had that freedom, because he had like an element of influence on his creativity. The Codyverse, another example, everything was hot in AEW in 2021. And then there was this outlier, well, too, because Matt Hardy was there. But the main outlier was the Codyverse. <laughs> and it was just like, why is Cody the one thing wrong about this? Because Cody was allowed to be Cody for better and worse and all that sort of stuff. CM Punk. You know, like a lot of what happened with CM Punk and, you know, that's, I don't, I don't want this to become a punk podcast, but it just doesn't happen without- You get the best and worst of yeah, him. Yeah, because the freedom- With this framework. The freedom of this all-timer program, yeah. the seminal work with MJF doesn't exist without it. The reality of so much of what went down across a year, realistically, between Brawl Out and Wembley, again, doesn't happen without freedom. AEW will always be judged, I think, by its wider popularity, but it at least will always be judged, I think, on those terms. Uh, Matt Jackson then at the Double or Nothing ticket announcement rally said, Tag Team Wrestling has become a lost art, but that is about to change. We vow to give you the best tag team division in the world. I would argue that um, AEW did precisely that for the first, I would say, two years of its existence. Um, 2019, you could argue SCU weren't really great champions in the run, but look how much they got over yeah. um, at Double or Nothing and All Out, opening those shows, how like sort of well-received that act was. Um, Santana and Ortiz, underneath that title reign, had a big program with the Young Bucks. The idea was, yes, we'll have a title program, but we want to explore grudge feuds outside of it. I mean, that they had a, um, a street fight in late 2019 to, to pay off that feud. A Big time tag team grudge match main eventing one of your first episodes of TV. And then you get to 2020. I think one of the best modern tag team pictures ever with that incredible Young Bucks versus Kenny Omega and Hangman Page program. The Kenny Omega and Hangman Page tag team. How brilliantly they use tag team wrestling. Not only is something that would get the longest match on a pay-per-view, which it did at Revolution 2020, mm -hmm. which I'm not going to say anything more about because I would be here all day <laughs> discussing that match. But that was the longest right match on the pay-per-view, if not the main event. Um, the reign itself between Page and Omega was brilliant. It did exist as a vehicle to drive that singles program forward, um, but it was something great in and of itself as well. Um, FTR. Coming in, that was one of the big storylines on Dynamite. Um, people have got differing opinions on the full gear match between um, FTR and the Young Bucks, but again, they got 30 minutes on that pay-per-view. Didn't main event, which was a shame. I think at least one of those two matches could have. And I think People, one, us, have different opinions on that match, and yet the FTR-Young Bucks rivalry being folded in the Page and Omega was ingenious. That was absolutely incredible. The like, idea... From the moment they showed up and everything that followed. The amount of genuinely in-depth booking that, yes, it drove the wider picture, but was all centralized within that tag team division. FTR coming in, much like they would cut the ring in half, cutting the elite in half, yeah. with the idea being we can only have these tag team titles if we shatter the confidence of Hangman Page in the way that Hangman Page sold the gravity of losing those titles. I feel head to toe like poison, I think he said in a really great sit-down interview with JR. They took these tag team titles, they're not where they once were no. by any stretch of the imagination. But in 2020, 2021 with the books run as well, for those first two years, they booked those titles so well. And it ties into another point we're going to make later in the podcast of wins and losses matter, losing those titles to the Hangman Page character mm -hmm. almost destroyed that person who he was playing on television. You know, that was serious serious business. I think they upheld that promise for as long as they could. Mm. 
is a question for you. We talked a lot, obviously, about AEW being a catalyst for change for WWE. Mm-hmm. Without AEW, without their emphasis on the tag team division, is there a tag team WrestleMania main event? Um, it's tough, that one, isn't it? Because Vince McMahon hated tag team wrestling. You made mm-hmm. no secret of it. FTR, like, making tag team wrestling feel important. This wasn't their first rodeo, was it? <laughs> it was so crucial in that yeah. happening in NXT's golden era. Five years earlier, whatever it was, it was clearly something Triple H identified in that NXT run. And then he gets the book and it main events WrestleMania. And again, to echo uh, what I will say is that if you want to look at it this way, I would say the WrestleMania main event feels very much almost like a something of a tribute to Sidgwick's description of that in that tag main event was folded into the bloodline story, the bigger bloodline story, Cody, Roman, all of that sort of stuff. And in much the same way, FTR and the Young Bucks could have and possibly should have gone on last to emphasise just how integral it was. WWE were able to capitalise on that. Nobody questioned that match going on last. Nobody at all. It was nearly a riot when it was suggested that it wasn't going to make that night one. And I think nobody would have questioned the books and FTR. That would be one of the first... Look, we're we're reviewing these five years in. That is both... Uh, like hardly any time at all and yet quite a long time in pro wrestling when you're following it 52 weeks a year. That was a big optics loss. For the Young Bucks not to get to a pay-per-view main event before WWE, when it's their company, was a huge optics defeat, in my opinion. Um, and they probably could have had it at the division's peak in 2020. They did it this year. They did it this year, finally, with Sting, and it drew, and it was yeah. and, it, and it was it was always the match. It was always the match. So they got there, um, but it was, a, it was an optics defeat, and it was one. I think in a number of ways, I think AEW, when you looked at the, um, the tide turning, maybe in like... 2022, and then especially into 2023, I think a lot of the success stories in 2023, I don't know if this is going to overlap one of the, the other points in this list, but I, an easy one is stables, for example. There were things that we'd seen, tried, tested, worked to an extent, and then maybe slightly abandoned, and do we were like, we'll have that. We can definitely yeah. still do that and run it. And I would say the rest of 2023 is an exa- um, 30, 39 is an example of that. Uh, Let's move on then to Tony Khan on Busted Open Radio in May of 2019 saying people love being the elite, but you don't want to do funny ha-ha when you do a serious wrestling show. We're not going to go out of the arena. We're not going to spend half the show backstage in dressing rooms or backstage choreographed segments. Right. Okay. He was very insistent in the same interview uh, where he expands on that answer saying I want pretty much all of it. All the action that unfolds like you'll see on Dynamite in and around the ring. And again... So what he was basically saying, I think, the subtext was he was trying to be nice about BTE, like, and he was trying to basically say, you're not going to see that on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like he was trying to, like, basically... People didn't know what Dynamite would look like, did they? No. So, you know, yeah. I remember when... Got Kenny, to the picture, isn't he? Kenny Omega played a character on BTE just for three weeks, for three weeks at a time, at a laugh. They would just do these weird things and then drop it because it was basically just a show that they used to indulge their own sense of humor. And the build stuff, obviously, all in yeah, happened yeah. and was driven by it. But sometimes they would just do bits that they enjoyed for three weeks and thought people might enjoy as well. Kenny Omega just went a bit unhinged for a bit. And people thought, you can't play this character on TV. And I think this is just Tony Khan fundamentally saying it's not being the elite. That's a separate thing. This is going to be a serious wrestling show. However, this does tie in with a lot of points when he was saying stuff like less scripted soapy drama, we're going to have, you know, serious sports-based presentation, et cetera, et cetera, and that'll come up Mm -hmm. um, a a little bit later. This is basically his way of saying it's not going to be being the elite. But at the same time, if if you look at the wording there, he kind of did betray that promise in 2023. He was basically saying, we're not doing BTE. We're going to do unscripted promos to sell the fights, and then you're going to see the fights. No stunts, no skates, no vignettes, etc., etc., etc. Given that it was the main event program, and people will debate the success of it, and whether it was worth it or whether it was good for as long as any AEW program ever, MJF versus Adam Cole was like there was backing music to those vignettes that took place in Chinese restaurants and gyms and boats and not wrestling rings. Yes. Half of the time. He did, in fact, spend half of the show outside to build his main event program. So it's one of those, I mean, what we should probably say as well at this point is, did anyone reasonably expect all of these promises to be upheld for the entire duration of AEW? 
Or are you realistic and think at some point it's going to evolve? Everything has to mm. evolve. You adapt or you perish. Uh, and why I'm paraphrasing Triple H, but here I am. And uh, I, it's just, it probably was unreasonable to expect it to be the same thing forever. Also, on that point, it's fair to defend AEW by saying, well, no one could have predicted a global pandemic where... Do I don't even count that. No. I'd, I'm sorry. I know I've just stepped on your dick with that point. Mm. But when they did the first stadium stampede, it's like, of course you're going to do something yeah. with that kind of levity. Why would you have wasted blood and guts when there was not even the distanced fans yeah. in yeah. Daly's Place, for example? But things like Le Dinner Debonair, which was quite divisive. Yeah. Like, I loved it. But, you know, I know some people were like, this isn't wrestling. This isn't what it is. Like, every company was forced to be creative in those scenarios, yeah. and it wouldn't have worked if it was just wrestling match, wrestling match, wrestling match, and promo in an empty ring or a ring, yeah. uh, an arena with 20 wrestlers just stood around it. If you drop Le Dinner Debonair in October 2019, it's an immediate betrayal. If you do it in 2020, it's because necessity is the mother yeah. of invention. The yeah. context is everything with that pandemic, and uh, people rightfully so deify 2020 AEW. Like, that product is remarkable, quite honestly. It is. The... So I have two issues. To Cedric's point, by the way, I was a real cynical piece of work, a piece of gab, because I was just burnt. I'm a lifetime Fed fan, and that comes with being burnt by stuff as well. Burnt by promoters thinking, I'm just not going to stick to this. I don't know why they're doing this. The point of this, to zoom out a little bit, the point of the list or the things they want to lay out was in part to galvanize the audience. It wasn't individual things to be kept to. It was all of it. It wasn't like a manifesto. no. If we that was how do I read this. it as, as a cynic. And I was thinking, he's going to break all the promises. That's what people do. But it definitely, so much of it, made a lot of people go, I'm in, and I'm in for keeps, because if you thought this much, I will stick with you through the fires and flames sort of thing. The, where, this, it didn't burn my ass anymore, but it would have done at the time, is when you reach the point in AEW where, no, there wasn't daft vignettes to music, but the backstage interviews might as well have been because it was the interruption cue. I love that analogy yeah, you always yeah. gave. That's just as bad. Like, that was in line with the promise, but it was such a bastardized version of what they probably had in their head that it was just as bad. Like, I would I would have taken a vignette once in a while over the, wait a minute, you were here at the time when I was having my interview? We're feuding with each yeah. other. Like, that, that, you know, that yeah. sort of became as big a problem as just doing a wacky vignette in the first place. It certainly stripped them of character development because that was the thing that the, the rivals did. And I think, like, again, like, so much of this really, really puts you in the mind of how one version of pro wrestling blew a monopoly, doesn't it? Because you hear these things and it just immediately transfers you. He might as well just outright say... No, Gary the Goat Garber, I promise you. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because people needed to hear that for a, an opposition to exist. This brings us back to another point, and actually another thing I'm going to mention, because you, you alluded to it earlier, so we might as well talk about it now. You were often said as well, it wasn't a hard and fast rule, but generally they would say, right, what would WWE in 2019 do in this scenario? Not necessarily we'll do the opposite, but we'll do something different. And the Warner Brothers press release in 2019 also says they're going to focus on producing fast-paced, high-impact competitions offering fans less scripted soapy drama. Yeah, in general, this press release, where back in business, wrestling's back, that isn't WWE on major cable networks. If you go through it word by word, right, and I'm going to make a point on a different point <laughs> later, right, but if you go through it word by word, the whole gist is it's barely coded subtext for it's not going to be like the Fed guys. Yeah. That's the might as well. Of, you know, like that, that the famous Michael Jordan thing. Was it like, hello, I'm back or whatever. Mm. That's all or whatever it was when he came back after playing baseball for the Bulls. They might as well have just done something like that short, to the point, impactful, make a wrestling headline, especially when they said they were in a war yeah. and it was all of that puffed chest rhetoric. We're not going to be WWE guys. The end. That's basically mm -hmm. what they said. But just to, you know... Say it again, sorry, the... Uh, offering fans less scripted soapy drama. And high impact. High impact uh, competition, Jen, fast-paced output. I mean, that was basically just saying there's not going to be an in-house style. We're not going to be the promotion that picks a wrestler, recruits a wrestler, scouts a wrestler, recruits the wrestler, brings them in, strips them of that which got them over in the first place mm. on the indies. Um, Preeminent example being Ricochet. He's in the news. 
it wasn't quite the same Ricochet. If you go back and watch Dragon Gate Ricochet, it's not the same as Monday Night Raw Ricochet. PWG Wrestler is pretty much the same as AEW Wrestler, and I think that's what they were trying to communicate there. And again, it's like, how much do you try and drill into less scripted, soapy drama? That, to me, was basically just, it's not going to be the Fed. Yes. It's yeah. not going to be. Like, I wouldn't have taken it that much at face value if I was reading it at the time. It's like, all right, just going to do a sporting framework. And you're not going to do scripted promos, basically, which is kind of true, which we'll elaborate on further. Um, I This is basically just, we're not going to be WWE. Obviously, if you look at even something like really, really good, and I think a lo- universally among AEW fans, really, really good, the patriarchy is just a twisted sick soap opera. That's basically what it is. With the son going with the stepdad. Yes. The step, like, going with the mother and stuff, and basically saying he's my son not the dead husbands. It's like, it's a sick, twisted, pretty funny soap opera. At some point, the pet dinosaur's going to turn. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Um, and the, like Tony Storm, that's yeah. soapy as it gets. It's pro wrestling is a soap opera, so I don't know what they were thinking with that statement. Um, and they obviously didn't, you know, uphold that promise. The higher, like they can use general terms and then you kind of don't need to be held to them the more general you get. But I would argue that they were held to it, they delivered it, and if anything... Five years shows you that's probably the turnaround time where you need to rethink it because we have talked at length, probably for years now, years plural, about how good became normalised, great became normalised, and we are recording this just after all of us agreed, oh, that simply incredible breathtaking Ray Phoenix Will Ospreay match was a bit meh. Like, they have delivered it. They have delivered it to such an extent that we have become... I'm funny on the word spoil because I think it's okay as a consumer to just... Feel what you feel about the product you're consuming. But spoil, I get, I get that terminology, but certainly it has been normalized to the point where we're used to it. And I don't know that, like, you remember good WWE TV matches or good WWE TV runs, something along the lines of, like, the John Cena US title run. You remember consistent runs of good matches from periods in WWE because they weren't the norm. So you might remember, like, a good Shield run or something. Yeah. It was like, oh, this is unusual for WWE. Yes. Like, it's usual to the point of, Every single week, there's probably a four star kicking around. Like, that would have been, if you'd have just said it in those terms, Dave Meltzer will give a match a week on Dynamite, four and a quarter stars, and set it black and white. Probably has on average. And then <laughs> delivered it. I'm not joking. And yeah. then delivered it over five years. People, like, would say, nah, I know you've got Omega. It, that's not happening. And they've done it. They have absolutely done that. And they've definitely, the rising tide has raised all ships in terms of, like, North American television as well. Triple H was probably doing it on takeovers before that felt like it was starting to eat itself. They've done it on weekly television, like, and they have absolutely delivered it. But we have now reached the point where it's a bit like... I want more promos. What, yeah, like, what else is new? How are you adding a bit more depth or flavour or character to these matches instead of just the high... What was it, high-octane, high-impact action? Yeah, fast-paced, high-impact competition. That feels like the easy bit now. Yeah. Five years in, that feels like yeah. they've all figured out. Right, let's get in the second half of these uh, promises and uh, start with this one, Sige. Tony Khan on an interview with the wonderful Chris Van Vliet back in April of 2019. I've thought about appearing in an IA role and I'm not going to do it. I'm the president and the CEO and the founder of this company, but it's not going to be me all over TV and I'm not going to do in a lot of interviews or backstage segments on television. Right, there's two parts to this. <laughs> if you really read it, in good faith, he's not all over TV. No. He's... He's done the announcements. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thanks, guys. And, you know, he's done the odd thing where he's been collared backstage or whatever. Doing the TK driver was the stupidest thing, in my opinion, because he's just opened the door and invited all the ridicule. And ridicule is what he deserved, I think, because the bump was terrible. It was impossible to take seriously. It became a meme as opposed to this transgressive heat angle, etc. He's not all over the show, but you he's on it. Yeah. And he said he would never do it. And quite frankly, I think Tony Khan, the best booking version of Tony Khan is so detailed and he creates such interesting stories that you can just wade into and enjoy and love. Matchmaking, he's even better at that than booking. Tony Khan is a pathetic television performer. You talk. He must know it. He must know it, but thought, I have to do it for this reason. So I can then be represented by a Darby Allen, a Brian Daniels. Yeah. I feel in my mind, I must take this bump. He's 
terrible. Can you imagine having him having like an on-screen argument? It'd be even worse at bumping than that at bumping. Look, he's invited the ridicule, but he's not all over the show. And I, I would like to believe when this is all said and done, even though there's no stakes to anything, this ongoing AEW versus the Elite Angle, he'll learn his lesson. You talked about like uh, Jack Tunney when he just the match was just made, and they do that to a certain extent of like we just had word from Tony Khan this is yeah. official for Dynamite, this is official for the next pay per view or whatever. Um, and also, I will say there was a period of time, wasn't it, where Tony Khan makes huge announcement was a rain spike. It was, and it was what I think that was a red flag ultimately because the. I mean, it became a meme in yes. itself, didn't it? When when something comes a meme, you know it's a problem. But like the the regularity was a red flag that he had. Like, I'm not saying he got high on his own supply as such, but had like maybe started to enjoy the fact that there was an element of spike in the ratings or spike in the conversation or whatever it was that that was providing. Like, he reads the same Twitter, so he reads the same Twitter. Where he's like, ah, that's generated interest. Click along for you. That was an embarrassing performance. Here's a gif of all the funny bits where you kind of seem to forget what you were supposed to be saying. It's all on the same timeline to Tony Khan. So he knows one thing as much as the other, and yet he persisted doing it. So he must have believed in his mind it was the right thing to do for the business, for, for you know, for AW as a brand, for him as an authority figure. I know that's a weird term, but he is that. He is. He is that. He is an authority figure. Um, I think I would have loved him to preserve it. I This is where I think, like five years again, I'm repeating it, is a different period of time based on which bullet point you're talking about. Yeah. I think he could have made it five years by just being the guy in Tony Schiavone's ear. We've just heard, got word from Tony Khan, have those videos on people's phone where he comes and hypes up the crowd. That's actually quite a nice off-camera. That's like watching The Undertaker fire up at a house show. Tony Khan's a bit weird, <laughs> but then when you're in the building, we experienced it. It's kind of funny. Hey! It's, kind of, it's kind of endearing. Like, it is endearing. His hardcore base adore it, right? That stuff getting shared online you're an arsehole if you mock that because that's just something for a live crowd and they're mostly popping. So you're delivering something mm. free, for, like added value for your live crowd. If you'd have that, plus I've had word from Tony Khan, the match is made. It's official. Like that was probably the happy medium. I think five years is not that long, but wrestling bookers are wrestling bookers yeah. and things only move quicker. He's never done anything that's been necessary. Yeah. Look, he's never, ever, I know he took the Tony Khan driver, but I'm reiterating, I hated that angle, yeah. and I don't really like the resulting storyline, but I still maintain he did that so he could then have Danielson, Dax, Cash, Darby, Eddie at the time stand up for him. Mm. I don't even like the story, but that's the point. Like, he's never been Dixie Carter, he's never been Vince McMahon, he's never been Vince Russo or Eric Bischoff. I'd rather he didn't do anything, but I would say, broadly speaking... I would say he's upheld this one. He's not all over it. And when you make it, he said, I'm not going to do many interviews. He said, yeah. he never yeah. said he'll, he, he never, never said yeah. you will never see me on this TV ever. Mm -hmm. He didn't say it, it, I remember the, the Moxley week and it was like, here we go. Like he's knocking on the door and he's like featured in it, but then yeah, he didn't yeah, see yeah. his face. And it was almost like a powers that be thing with Vince Russo where he was like, well, if you don't see me, it doesn't count. I think it was more like, I know what I said, but this is a good way to, mm like convey that the John Moxley character's angry. He could have just did a promo where he said, I knocked on his door and that asshole said, oh, whatever. You'll know. So pop quiz. Can you remember Tony Khan's first on-screen appearance? Was it? No, it is. No. Oh. No. No. It's so weird. And it's like, it with Nyla Rose. It was. It should have told us. He's wearing like a Danny Deals jacket that looks about three sizes too big. And he's sort of like, hey, you want the title? And Nyla Rose, like, does he reach for a hug? Yes. And Nyla Rose like, this is really weird. <laughs> and there's no explanation for why all the title wins and all the moments. This was like, this person should greet Tony Khan backstage. It was never explained or anything. And we should have known then. Ah, it's kind of strange fella. Yeah. <laughs> well, sticking with that Chris Van Vliet interview from April of 2019, uh, this is a clip that's been shared quite a lot recently. I think one of the major issues with WCW was that they had a very large roster with a lot of people making a lot of money. You can't pay every talented person in the business $100,000. <laughs> You can you can have to make three fifty though. You can have to make smart decisions, and you can't hire every person you like, and you can't hire every person that you think is good because there's a lot of really really good talented people. For context, he said this on the basis of you will eat up your budget if you do all this, okay? And that's mm -hmm. why WCW went out of business on one of the reasons or whatever. Tony Khan has essentially unlimited funds. 
People have made this point before. I will echo it. I will echo it. People do not understand how much one billion dollars is, yeah. <laughs> and he's got more than one, more, he's got more than one billion dollars. Yes. So for context, he did say this within the context of you'll go through your budget. But in addition to budget, if you do what he said not to do, which he's done, <laughs> probably a billion times over, you're going to completely destroy the hierarchy of AEW, which he's done. And I mean, he's banked the rights here. He's absolutely banked the rights, whether he can bankroll it all or not. You shouldn't just because you can, because look what's become of the product. You have got this system now or this weird hierarchy where he doesn't like to beat people. And a lot of top stars in wrestling, you might be shocked to understand this, don't want to do jobs. <laughs> so you've got this like authoress of things yeah. where it's like, don't want to do a job, I don't want to be anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you shake hands on that. So you've got, I would say, double digits wrestlers who are going to lose far more often than they are going are going to win far more often than they are going to lose. And quite rightly, because if they want to be stars, that's kind of how you do it. Like I know you got injured, but Copeland was there, Moxley, MJF, um, give us more names who win all the time in AEW. Osprey, Swerve Strange. Orange Cassidy wins all the Orange time. Orange Cassidy wins all the time. There's, there's probably loads I'm missing yeah. out, right? Okay. And then underneath you've got the people he quite likes and might want to do something with, like your Takeshtas and your Garcias are yes. always on that precipice. Rushu, he seems to like. And then you've got Jay Lethal's your Brian Cage. This is obviously the men's singles division. Mm -hmm, yeah. You could argue something similar happens in the women's as well. Um, if you just... And the thing is, in doing this, not only is the hierarchy broken, not only do you get these like repetitive stretches of TV where the new person comes in and has a lot of TV matches that they simply win. Happened with Copeland. Just to use a very recent example... Um, so you destroy your patterns of booking. You make everything all the more predictable. Um, so that is a huge problem with it in and of itself. But basically, his thing was WCW was greedy. Right? The roster was overstuffed and blah, 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 blah. And I know he's talking about it in, in relation to it being a budget concern. But at the same time, because he has signed everyone. <laughs> Imagine how bad you have to be to not get signed by Tony Khan or at least have a cameo. It is Genuinely something that comes up in the WWE release lists where you're kind of mentally doing the gymnastics of who you think is going to get the go and you are demoting them if they're not getting a shot in AEW, aren't you? In your head? You're, yeah, you're going like, how bad must probably you wouldn't be? take a chance on them. Right? They, like, if you don't even get a one shot of Tony Khan, yeah. you must be like pretty low in the pecking order and it affects your perception mm -hmm. of these wrestlers. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't want to chew him out because he's had a really, 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 really good career with some incredible highlights. Nick never stocks really low. Exactly. I was thinking you know what I mean? You said it. Yeah, exactly you know what I mean? Enough. Yeah. Anyway, but the point I'm trying to make here is that, like, it's not just other oh, patterns of the booking and, like, the budget concerns and everything else. It's like you've normalized through your greed. You've signed literally everyone. Like, Osprey Carter Money follows Cole, Danielson, Punk. And then you've got Swerve. You've got Keith Lee. You've got Jay White. You've got <laughs> everyone. Like, who could possibly come in now and make the impact? And you need this. Mm. You need people to make an impact. And just, I don't want to take him out either, right? It's not the podcast for that. And he's done really well. And I think he's banter. Tamatonga, right, was a significantly lesser star in the world of New Japan Pro Wrestling yep. than Kazuchika Ricardo and Will Ospreay, right? And I know it's different because you appear under the WWE lights, in front of that stage, and you're automatically a bigger star. I'm not an idiot. I'm not trying to argue in bad faith. I know how it works. But at the same time, like, in late 2021, Punk and Danielson, that's when it was, like, approaching Raw levels. Yeah. And now it's gone that other way. Maybe it's not just the Levesque-Vince curve, but it's also AEW done absolutely everything. This greed, and he's banged to rights on this point, like, he's just normalized the jump. Can you imagine, like, Moxley, double or nothing, Mm. How is this happening again? This shouldn't have happened. The monopoly rule was in effect for so long. I literally couldn't believe, like, this can happen again. This can happen again. Five years later, we're at a point where it's like, oh, another one. You made a really good point on uh, the NXT preview we did this week. We're dating this slightly, but Cody Rhodes has turned up on NXT in what seems to be a failed attempt to win them a ratings week. 
But you made the point of we probably need to move past the conversation where I can't add NXT cheating. Tony Khan can sign any restaurant <laughs> in the world yeah, and hire yeah. with a dynamite graphic. Cody Rhodes like, was on dynamite <laughs> yeah. for two and a half years. Yeah. Like there, there isn't well, so using people from the main roster. You had Cody Rhodes for two and a half years. Like they could stack it up and then he's like, hmm, these wrestlers DM should I slide into who will definitely fly to the building I've got dynamite in and work yeah. like this week. The, do you know the thing that got me about this one? Because, yeah, like, w I read, we were going through these yesterday, and I read that one out loud, and you said, yeah, that line, that's a killer, isn't it? That line, that 100 that You can't just sign all the good wrestlers, and it's specifically all the good wrestlers. Oh, man. Like, what gets me about this now, in retrospect, is the memories of learning about who this Tony Khan figure was, and the money was so vital. Like, you said it about, like, Unicorn takes all of these things, and Tony Khan is the, so the centre of all of it. But, like, the more you learn... And then somebody on Twitter posts a picture where you can spot him in the ECW arena. And then, like, somebody finds that he was the one that started this lead thread in the DVR, DR forum. And you're like, oh, my God, student of the game. So he's not Billionaire just... Billionaire student of the game not just speaking taste. in terms of budgets. He also knows why that locker room failed WCW as much as WCW failed that locker room. And the student of the game... You has, should know more than has most. Made, ...has made the mistake. You've said it before. It said, like, does Tony Khan need help or was he so smart at wrestling that he drew Wembley Stadium in 2023? Yeah. AEW's, like, widely accepted worst creative year filled that building, right? Like, that's because he understands the wrestling business. And that's what leapt out to me there is, like, he's acknowledging a massive mistake through the books he has read, the TV he has watched, the documentaries he has consumed, the thing that made us all go, ah, oh, crap, he's one of us. This this has got way more chance than some money mark. This yeah. is like it's a huge fatal mistake that he would have been the first to be like, well, don't do that, and he's just sort of done it. Yeah, but I think also it's also a part of us that have to take the blame. I.e., yes, the yeah. so and so is all elite has become like a joke almost at this point. But at the same time, even now, but back then, definitely, you were like, we well, if they've gone, if they if they're free. Definitely get them. Definitely get them. Oh, I'd love to see them on, on Wednesday nights or whatever. What can they do away from the shackles? Exactly. It's very hard Even to see now, the tipping point until it's tipped as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. We talk about, just two perfect examples, Chad Gable and Becky Lynch. Yeah. Like. Yeah, sign them both. Yeah. <laughs> it's full. No more, no more. Oh, you can get Becky Lynch. Yeah. Well, obviously, you can get Becky. Obviously, bring her in if you can get Becky Lynch in. Or a, what, what if Chad Gable becomes available? I'm, on, I'm, I'm saying don't get Ricochet. And it's pointless. They're getting him. And the problems will be compounded. Because you're going to get more. Ricochet's going to have to be the guy who wins six weeks' worth of Dynamite matches. And then when he's in, they have to squeeze somebody out because they don't fit. Bye, Takeshita. Bye, Garcia. Like, I worry about the progression of these wrestlers who um, I want to invest in. Ricky and I, Starks has been yeah, yeah, You forget yeah. he exists. I think Takeshita's a top three wrestler in the world. He's incredible. Mm. But no, you're right, Wilborn. We are hypocrites because yeah. whenever he's done that, like I'm at the point where I've written no, no ricochet, right? I honestly sat here. This is ridiculous now looking where he is and what he's done in AEW already. I was like, you can't have Osprey. Yeah. You can't. Look at Swerve. And I was kind of right for a while of like, look, at, look what will happen to Swerve if Osprey comes in. Case by case, I'm obviously going to sign him. Yeah. I'm going to sign him. But yeah, he's had a mare. He's had an absolute mare. Uh, on Busted Open Radio in May of 2019, Tony Khan said, we're going to provide a serious sports-based product with the best wrestling. Right, this is where, first of all, best wrestling is completely subjective. I personally think it is. I mean, Danielson, Ricky Stark, strap match. I don't care what style of wrestling you like. If your soul isn't set on fire <laughs> watching that, there's, you just don't like wrestling. I'm sorry, that's it. Say the quote again, because I've got a mini rant brewing. A serious sports-based product with man. the best wrestling. Right. A serious sports-based product. There are one million things you can say that betrays that promise. And you could start with the very first show AEW ever promoted. And the Dark Order are weird creeps. <laughs> <laughs> you won't see them in the UFC, obviously. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you see a lot of people worse than the creepers at those UFC shows. I know. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> but the thing, right, is I would argue that fundamentally this promise has A, been upheld, and I'm going to use a few examples to illustrate, okay? And B, we live in a pretty bad time. Mm -hmm. And in pop culture, people are so desperate for money, and it's increasingly difficult to monetize things, right? How many times have you seen things get rebooted, right? I've seen things get rebooted, 
And I'm like, this is great for me. You're not going to make any money off this <laughs> at all. But anything, anything that has got an audience, right? A lasting, enduring audience, even on a cult level basis, will get rebooted because I think there's just no one wants to take the risk on an original property, mm -hmm. right? No one wants to do that. We've seen it time and time and time again in so many different mediums, right? They rebooted Twin Peaks. And it's like, right, it was a sensei. Ah, it's my favorite thing in the world, Twin Peaks, right? In 1990, it was this overnight sensation. Who killed Laura Palmer? America was talking about it for a couple of months, right? Did they not realize what kind of filmmaker David Lynch, I mean, I know he started with a razor head, but what kind of filmmaker he just became mm. after Twin Peaks. Like, you're not going to get a water cooler television program <laughs> out of David Lynch in the mid 2010s. I'm so glad you bankrolled it. I don't think it made anything. Even Blade Runner, like, that's never going to make anything. Mm. They just threw money at it, right? The point I'm trying to make is that something, right, has had an enduring appeal on like a mass scale once, right? People will throw money at it, right? Has this happened with Battle Arts, Rings, or UWFI? <laughs> Those shoot style promotions, right? No. no. If people really, truly wanted, I just want- 300 people a year for Bloodsport. I was just about to make the point as well. <laughs> if people truly wanted the strictest sports-based presentation of the most realis realistic looking pro wrestling matches held with no soap whatsoever, barely even any promos, just, no, I just want sport. UFC is there for that, mm. for one, right? Sport is there for that. Sport is there for that. <laughs> sport is there for that, right? More to the point, like there's been times when people really wanted it. Like look at Ring of Honor. Had, yeah. I mean, it had storylines and it had promos and it had some wacky characters. Mainly, if there was such an appetite for that, that would have exploded. Mm -hmm. There just never was. There never was. And the people who say, nah, I needed, I needed battle arts. It's the one of the only properties, UWFI, in the shoot style Japanese promotions. You know, it was massive at one point. Mm -hmm. It was truly massive, but all of Japanese pro wrestling was. If there was, like, people would have bankrolled that if there was genuinely a market for it. You, people are just saying things. Because they want to attack Inoki it. isn't killed Nuge. Exactly. Right there. You know what I mean? Like, it just, it drives me up the wall. They will reboot anything except that. Yeah. <laughs> Literally anything gets rebooted if they think, like, what's the other bit? Uh, it's, uh, provide a serious sports-based product with the best wrestling. Right. They've told sports-based stories. They continue to, I think, within the framework of, and I dig this out because I think they do too many, right, look at Collision, right? This wrestler has to win this match to move them up the standings, even if there's not a formal ranking system, up the standings so they get a shot at a title in a few wins time. It's happening right now, a time of recording with Daniel Garcia and the international title held by Will Ospreay. He's won a time of recording, uh, two matches in four days, with the idea being he'll win a match, he'll win a match, he'll win a match. That's sport. Mm -hmm. That's sport. Kenny Omega returns from injury ahead of All Out 2022, right, okay. He tells a story of an athlete who may not be in his physical prime anymore, but has got the intense mental acumen to succeed and come back and persevere through the pain, right? If anything, that was too much of a sport. How many comebacks have you seen in sport? Mm -hmm. He was telling the comeback story that happens in sport for reals, right? If anything, the com Kenny Omega's commitment in that part of his career, right, was in fact so sports oriented in terms of the realism he was going for, like no one comes back like, I'm a big megastar and I'm back and I'm in ring shape. Like how many times have you seen, like we follow football, I think, is the three, is the thing that mm -hmm. connects us three. How many times have you seen a star player come back from injury? Doesn't start the match, win the match, and get the winning goal nine times out of 10, they get gently brought off the yes. bench, give them their minutes, get them ring ready. That was a story Omega told, but because he hasn't presented himself as this superstar, megastar, fictional theatrical character, who's got this, he made you wait to see the physique and the tan mm -hmm. and the entrance and all the rest of it. Like, 
It was too sports oriented <laughs> for its own good. Which because he didn't look like a marketable fake pro wrestling star. To Omega and AEW's immense credit, by the way, because this gets forgotten a little bit, which itself was kind of a dropped thread in light of Brawl Out because he was insecure that Hangman Page had already been asked. Yeah. He, he rang the Young Bucks and said, I'm fine, I'll come back. So he was rushing his own return because they were layering something in there with like, oh, we'd ask Page and he said, no, I'll do it, I'm fine. What are you asking for in the first place? I'm Football will do that if they've dropped their stuff. Yeah. They've been dropped. A panic mm -hmm. about like, oh, I'm going to stay on the bench at this rate. Yeah. I need to like force my way back into the team sort of thing. It's and too it, sports oriented for its own good. That that died in the reins. It truly died as, yeah. a, as a thing. As the, it was, you ingrate. <laughs> Have a little patience if you want your sports oriented stories. There is. Yeah, there, it's so important to. When was that caught? Uh, May of 2019. Right. Again, it's so important to try and understand, and I'm sure most people watching this, listen to it, were, were watching at this point. It feels like we've got the sustained audience mm -hmm. now from 2019. Um, to understand the context of which those words were delivered, had he used a different phrase, one that's become popularised in the era of AEW even existing? I wish I knew who came up with this because they were, like, they, they nailed it. Day one. Less case now, but certainly in 2019. WWE, for the longest time, was a show about wrestling. Tony Khan wanted to produce a wrestling show. And hmm. the difference was massive, and it's less so now, but it's still there. Like, I, I like WWE. You I, love it. I love its current style. It is the wrestling product for me and my tastes in pro wrestling as much as it's ever been right now. And it is still more of a show about wrestling than AEW is a wrestling show. Mm. Definitely. And if he'd have... If Tony Khan had hit those words before that Twitter account or whoever came up with that phrase and did it would have been a, a point that I don't think you'd be able to question. Because this is be the stick to, they used to be. wouldn't be a stick yeah. to beat him with, yeah, because it would be like, well, yes, absolutely. What I'm watching here fundamentally is a wrestling show. These people turn up for work for their scheduled match, which they are supposed to want to wrestle. I love Ariana Grace, but she remains yet another character in wrestling that seemingly doesn't want to be there. Yes. <laughs> it sticks out like a sore thumb when one of them characters is in AEW. When you, you can just ask the first, what do you mean you don't want this match? What do you mean you don't want this? Like the, every now and then a character will come along and you're like, you don't fit. You do not fit because everyone here is like, can, there's enough belts to go for now. Why doesn't Malachi be, back want a belt? Yeah, you should be competing for one because there's enough to go for. And that's what all of this is. If you if you are not a wrestler saying the belt is the reason to be here, then you've kind of like... You don't pulled, fit in the world. You've pulled at that loose thread where none of it makes any sense. Cody Rhodes, October 2019, he's in an interview with IGN and said, we're going to try and present quality over quantity. Right. He said, we're going to try. I think Cody Rhodes knows as well as anyone the reality of business on a broader level. So I've taken that quote with the idea being that it applies to the way that the model has changed over the years because they originally just said, this was like another response to how WWE functioned in 2019. Um, and it was so bad that people thought, well, WWE is always going to be like this. Yeah. Because he'd had the 2014 Royal Rumble. He had the 2015 Vince Royal is going to die in his chair. Vince is going to die in his chair. You've had the summer of punk. You've had disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. People thought the business model was going to persist in AEW because AEW was, uh, WWE was going to always exist in that state. Vince was going to die in his chair. And again, the model how much they had to do with it, you know, it's they're always going to be sort of operating under the guidance and instruction of their cable TV paymasters. It's financial oxygen. But the model was two hours a week, it's all you need, and four huge events that will feel huge mm -hmm. per year, right? I wish, I, st I don't want Collision. I really like, sometimes love an episode of Collision, right? I don't want it to exist. I want the old model to exist. I want to not have to watch so much content. I'm 38, I've got a family, I've got two kids, I've got other interests. I fall asleep on the couch before I go upstairs at about 20 past nine. Just to jump in there, that's not you just speaking of your experience. That is the target audience yeah, they go for the you were describing. They so go for the laps WWE guys. Yeah, that was what they went for. Yeah. Event, like the thing, right? Okay. Um, so it isn't just me. It isn't. They appeal, as Hamlet correctly points out, to people like me. I didn't like WWE much after 2001, but I've stuck around. Well, that's you. That is you. And that's Tony Khan. Yeah. That's Cody Rhodes until he went back. Mm. Truly, it was. So he's right. It was always, oh, it's unrealistic. If Warner says, oh, we're giving you this, what are you going to do? Say, no. 
it wasn't Tony Khan's idea. Obviously, it was his idea to do Punk Collision versus Elite Dynamite. A terrible idea. That even Punk said was a terrible idea. But he didn't go, I can have two more hours. They went, yeah. They went, this is successful. Hence, it is successful. Hence why they're given Collision. Uh, you've got it. So do it. Bischoff hated Thunder for the same reasons, didn't he? The exact same. He got the call and he was like, I can't say no to Ted Turner yeah. while, we're, while we're winning. Yeah. And worst worst thing at the worst time, yeah. basically. Yeah. I mean, I, it was always unrealistic, this. And it was Cody Hughes setting it. I know his management at the time, but he wasn't, you know, the head honcho. And even he said, we're going to try. Probably realized at some point. And again, everything gets rebooted, right? That's one of the rules of modern pop culture capitalism. Everything gets rebooted. Apart from the UWFI rings and battle arts, <laughs> right? Everything except that, right? Everything gets rebooted and everything gets diluted to win an inch of its goddamn life. We were talking about this the other day on, was it the collision? Another Q&A, we did an AW Q&A, which yes. you can still check out. Yeah. A lot of it's still relevant. Um, where Fraser Cranium, a longtime beloved listener of ours, said it'll be fated to have to go through this experience with every pop culture property we like, where it just gets like reduced and diluted and expanded beyond recognition. There Star are, Wars was the perfect example. We were right, talking about yeah, like yeah. Star Wars. Oh, you're in on this. Can you think of anything in the monoculture of the late 20th century where everything that gets big is massive and inescapable? Can you think of anything bigger than Star Wars or Michael Jackson? It's like in terms of film and music. Star Wars and Michael Jackson. Put it like this. I've seen one Star Wars film ever because my kids fancied to look at it at the, on Disney Plus yeah. and I feel like I know every element of the story of the first three. Yes. Because it was imprinted on every other yes. form of culture. Like every TV show or the film yes. referenced yeah. it because yeah. it was so vast and massive. It was the... Michael Jackson was the biggest thing in music yep. when I was growing up. And All of our ages, first album slash yeah. song slash I And I'm the same as you. I saw a million Star Wars references and things before I even saw Star Wars. In fact, it probably put me off. Yeah, I knew it. Probably put me off, I knew it. I knew the twist. You know, yeah. it's just that... Right. There are now Star Wars shows I don't know the names of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's. It, I find that unfathomable growing up as a 38-year-old, right? If something gets big... And again, there... Because there's so much competition for like your list, for your ears, for your eyes, for everything. Podcasts, YouTube, streaming, cable, cinema, live events, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you, please. Honestly, it's really hard this. Yeah. Like it's hard. Right. Like, because it's so hard to monetize anything, there's always that more is more. Well, if we do more, it's easier to monetize. Mm. I don't even they said, I'm gonna try not to do that. People are talking about it recently, obviously, with uh, them doing Rampage immediately after Dynamite, and people saying, is that a clue to them potentially stretching Dynamite to three hours? Which is a TV great deal. idea, of course. Well, I TV so. deals, etc. Like, I, Sid is right. Like, we, you, Dynamite would finish, and you'd go, oh, God, it's six days. I, I can't. Especially when you saw the match graphics. Yeah. Next mm -hmm. week, you're like, oh, my God, we're getting that. I, the, I think the now real... Don't, now I don't have time to watch Rampage. I don't. I think or this, really the inclination because it, everyone's stretched so thin. This might have happened before Collision, but I especially remember the period when Collision launched and they were still, they weren't sure where they sat with Rampage. The weeks, it was driven home, wasn't it, by this, the impossible Excalibur rundown. When those got uh, out of control yeah. and you had a battle of the belts of Collision and Rampage, you're you taking the piss out of me. Like that is just <laughs> like, and then you would read conversation along the lines of, uh, I'm an AEW fan, I, I want to see all the wrestlers, this is perfect for me. You still see it now with the long pay-per-views. Like that's exactly that represents value to me. So you're never going to find that one agreement on when when too much is too much and all that sort of stuff. I would be willing with this one to classify the uh, like it's gro it's literal growth. You get an hour for rampage, then you get even two for collision. That's growth of a business. Business is supposed to grow if they're successful. I would classify this as growing pains. And for how dicey it may have looked in 2023, I think they have rode out some of those growing pains here in 2024. So bigger picture. They've betrayed it, but they've gotten away with it as well. I don't, like, AW isn't, they haven't damaged the brand to the point where in WCW, Thunder was the tipping point, nothing could sustain itself. The wrestlers, the, the people in charge of creative, it was starting to die and it was starting to flag. They're not going to, like, if this had gone so badly that they actually compromised the TV deal that they're going to get, we'd have a conversation. But they haven't. We've they're got, still going to get it. We've actually got a really good case study here at What Culture. Scott Telford of What Culture Gaming Big AEW fan. I've never heard him say, I'm not watching that pay-per-view. Like, the pay-per-view thing has expanded. Yeah. I know, you know, it's it's more of an expense for people in a in a time when everything is is growing and growing in, in terms of costing you more and more money. 
But and I know there was a little bit of a dip for maybe one of the recent pay views. Dynasty, Dynasty didn't do a great job, but then uh, double or nothing, one hundred and thirty thousand surprise hit, really, that isn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't hear people now say I'm, I watch the TV, but I'm not going to bother buying the thing on Sunday or whatever. The conversion from Nielsen to pay per views is outrageous. Yeah, if you look at like two thousand and ten WWE pay per view numbers to the ratings they were getting. That conversion's pretty pathetic compared to it. So, yeah, they've kind of broke the most sort of, like, tentative promise imaginable, but it's worked for them. TNA's percentage yeah. was a oh, kill, uh, killer. Yeah, yeah. You can get 50,000 off, like, a million and a half a week, and that million and a half were going nowhere. Like, they were always there for you. 50, like, that's generous. Wasn't it 60 was the record? 60 might have been the record, yeah. yeah and every, like, a, a lot of doubled, tens. Yeah, yeah, a lot of tens, mm -hmm. eh? Uh, let's conclude then with the, the final promise. A Tony Khan quote from Talk is Jericho. Winning should make your day, make your week, make your year, and losing should break your heart. If that's not important, then what are we even doing this for? I would think that 99 times out of 100 wins and losses do matter. Like, very rarely will you see someone wrestle and win matches four times, then there's nothing happens, right? And I'm going to use a recent example because I think that's the best way of underscoring, yes, five years later, that has been upheld. Look what's happening right now at time of recording. Kyle O'Reilly, his character, he returned from that serious, serious mm -hmm. injury with the idea being, I want to do this on my own. And Roddy Strong, on day one, had said, you know, I don't think you can or whatever, or, you know, just come with us. Like, you know, it's the best way. And blah, blah, blah. And Kyle O'Reilly vowed, no, I want to do this on my own for once. And blah, blah, blah. And he has been deliberately positioned to lose narrowly in these really long, acclaimed, back and forth, grueling matches with the idea being, and I'll be wrong on this, I've already used the Hangman Page example, like wins and losses, there's a gravity to losing in this mm -hmm. promotion, that truly is. Um, but just to use the recent example, Kyle O'Reilly is going to turn heel because he couldn't get it done on his own, like he vowed to do, because those losses have slowly, slowly pecked at his psyche, and now is, yeah, it's not gone well from whatsoever. Pac just mentioned on Dynamite this week, what a triumphant return. You know, he acknowledges and he's miserable and he's doubting himself for the first time because he's lost a series of big high-profile matches. Going a little bit back in time, if you don't use the Hangman Page example, right, of he thought he'd lost everything by being a loser and not feeling elite. All Out 2020 happens, MGF, um, loses the big one to John Moxley, instantly goes, right, I need to completely, I need to strategize, think, right, how do I win? Winning is the most important thing in the world. And then he slowly, in plain sight, builds the pinnacle faction to give him a vehicle to win big wrestling matches, you know? Love that, because he looked around. Everyone's <laughs> got a stable. Everyone's, everyone's, got, yeah. everyone's got mates. Yeah. Like, um, Moxley did I can pretend to have them. Yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> Uh, so basically, people have either had uh, their demeanors changed when they lose, their confidence has been shattered, Hangman Page, they've reacted to a loss and thought, I need to do something huge, which is mm -hmm. going to take up all of the TV, which a lot of MGF Jericho did to get back at the pay window, as JR would say. <laughs> of course they matter in this company, and if they ever don't, then they're in deep trouble. Uh, I don't disagree. I do think other forces have damaged... How much they matter. That's not perfect, but it's still the promise has been upheld. Roster blow an abundance of titles. There has been too many examples of wrestler A losing a title match and then almost immediately backsliding into a different title match. That harms. Yes. That well, harms no, you, them, no, them. Oh Christ Almighty! That harms yeah. how you feel about the bigger picture, and that's the point of this. This win and loss, wins and losses do matter, right? But why they matter is because you're supposed to invest in all the wrestlers at different levels. It's, it's okay if you invest more in the main eventers than the undercarders, but you're supposed to invest in all of them because the wins and losses are supposed to drive the entire ecosystem. The more titles you throw in there, the more wrestlers that won't do jobs that you throw in there, that gets damaged. So I think they have tried to hold on to that mentality, and I think it has been quite badly damaged by the, um, the nature of what AEW looks like now compared to what it used to. We'll, we'll talk about it's another growing pain in the reality. Like the Cody Rose speaking of two hours a week in a pay-per-view, it's going to be very easy to track pretty much everyone you're watching. And if somebody... And you can give some people wins on Dark and Dark Elevation. And if somebody would drop onto Dark and off the Dynamite, that's an instruction to, like, 
sit back for a bit on them. But then if they rock back up with this winning record, you're like, right, well, I'm going to pay attention mm-hmm. again. It's I don't think it's where it should be in 2024, but I believe Tony Khan and Will Washington and some of the people that really care about those details want it to. Yeah. And it is often like other things collide with it. What I will say is I think back in 2019, uh, we we tried to make it clear to people that there was a lot of people very excited about a new wrestling war that had not lived through the first one. And there was this take that went around and we were kind of curmudgeonly about it, but we thought it's important that we say this, right? Uh, AEW coming back, it's going to make, going to give Vince a kick up the ass. It's not. I said it all along. It's not 1995. Said it all along. It is not. This isn't Nitro. Like, he's going to be angry about it. He's going to be pissed off when NXT gets its hearts handed to it, but he's not. No, it's not going to, right? That didn't transform WWE's fortunes. What has happened is when Triple H did end up in charge, he was probably, as the, like, chief of creative in WWE, embarrassed about how AEW's wins and losses and finishes had shown up WWE as a sham show. Like, yeah. like the amount of roars where we just took it as read that you were going to you'd be lucky to get one finish a week. You know, for all of those years, and like now a DQ in WWE is like nearly as common as a DQ in AEW and rarely do you. You are angry about it because it seems fair and in service of the story. We now take it for granted that pretty much on all the mainstream North American TV we watch, there are winners, losers, pinfalls, and submissions. And then when there's a screwy finish, it's probably part of the story and you're glad to see it. That is absolutely the influence of AEW. Like, you can argue different things have influenced different promoters at different times. It wasn't a thing in the North American mainstream before AEW brought it back. When it was Vince's WWE and Russo's t- TNA, it's like, can I have a... I'm begging you for a clean finish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I want a little, please, sir, can I have some sport? <laughs> to, to, to your point as well about uh, it not being as, as perfect as you'd hope for, but them at least trying to uphold it, when it doesn't reflect this, it's an, so egregious that you get Dave and Brian arguing about the BCC not being in the tag tournament. Indeed, mm. indeed, indeed. And uh, Brian was correct. Yes. <laughs> Brian was correct because the BCC never had their shot at the next pay per view. Yeah. Moxley and Claudio's tag team just disappeared off the face of the earth. So, but yeah, you're completely right. Yeah. It's a good point to make as well. It's like when they, it's like the outlier now when something really yeah. is like, what are you doing here? Like, why is that? It becomes a discourse. Mm. Fun to revisit these after five years, though. Uh, and just to make the final point, like, this isn't a way of going, ah. Uh, you didn't do that thing you said you were going to do five years ago. <laughs> like, did I lose weight when I said I wanted yeah. to do that a few years ago? No. I mean, I wish I could and all the rest of it. Like, things change, things evolve. Imagine if, uh, if Vince McMahon wrote a manifesto for the WWF <sighs> in 1993. Yeah. Well, the good guys have got to beat the bad guys and the crowd are going to send them happy. And he said, oh, by the way, you, you have to stick to that. There'd be no attitude here. Yeah. Like, yeah. things evolve. To be honest, I don't think they should have an AW. But they did, mm. and that was a direction taken. Um, would you like? Would you say that you prefer AW just the way you remember it? Just the way <laughs> I remember it. <laughs> Do you know, like, this won't happen. But honestly, right ahead of well, maybe when they get their new TV deal, which should be, by the way, a toast that most of these things have worked. They're going to get a monster deal. They're going to get a huge number. It's going to be well deserved. Like the money. AW can exist without the backing that we know that it's not good anywhere because it's owned by a billionaire, but the money mm. that is being paid for it will fund it. I would love them to do this again. Like, not a fresh start as such, but like, right, here's the next five years. Like, ask questions along the way. Give us markers to, like, sort of markers against. We'll set a new... Marry us, we will listen. Yeah, a hold new set of problems. Yeah, yeah, so we You're not, we're not asking you to hold us to 2019. The industry has changed 20 times over in the last five years. We're going to, here's our new 2024, manif- like, I've used manifesto, I don't mean it, but here's our new 2024 yeah. guidelines, like, for the duration of this next television deal with the money we've got, with how it's going to look with all our TV, da 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 like, and then come back again in five years, how did we do? I think it'd be really refreshing yeah. of a wrestling company that clearly has dialogue with its fan base to do something like that. The Ten Commandments. You made it the entire podcast. <laughs> there it is. That's so close. <laughs> <laughs>
This is why, after watching this, you need to jump over to the What Culture Wrestling podcast channel. Because mm. it's this every day, sometimes multiple times. Yeah. Uh, let us know. And it ain't made out of plastic. <laughs> <laughs> let us know your thoughts on everything we've discussed in the comment section below. We'll continue the conversation with us on X at What Culture WWE, where you can find all three of us as well. You can find Michael Hamflet at Michael Hamflet and Michael Sidgwick at M. Sidgwick. Find me at Adam Will and find us all, as I said, at What Culture WWE. And make sure you subscribe to What Culture Wrestling, wherever you get your podcasts from, for daily wrestling podcasts. But for now, it's been the What Culture Wrestling Roundtable. My thanks to Hamlet and to Sidgwick. Thank you for joining us. And we will see you soon. <laughs>